Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So Team Grace, today we celebrate the Feast of the Epiphany. There's a lot of things that come to the forefront on this feast day. I'd like to just highlight two and then draw a lesson from them. So the first is just a chronology of the Holy Family. So oftentimes, because liturgically we kind of cram it all together, people are sometimes confused. What happened when and where were the Holy Family and what was going on? So we know that Joseph was originally from Nazareth. So Nazareth is also in the region of Galilee. It's in the far north. It's like the state. That's the region of Galilee. Most of our Lord's life and the vast portion of his public ministry was in Galilee. Now Joseph was from Nazareth. So was Our Lady. But Our Lady also, her family, had a home in Jerusalem. We suspect that her, her, her father, a Joachim, might, might have been a priest of the temple. We're not sure. But we know they had a home in Jerusalem and they had a home in Nazareth. And we know, of course, that's where the whole scene happened between Mary and Gabriel was in Nazareth. Now, why did the Holy Family have to go to Bethlehem? Because the emperor, far away in Rome, heard about the tribal organization of Israel, but didn't realize that that tribal organization had faded. Even by like me saying I'm Irish-American, right? Or someone saying they're German-American. We're vaguely connected to this homeland that our forefathers, foremothers knew. And that's what the tribal system had become. But the emperor didn't know that, and he ordered a census. So the Holy Family had to go to the original home of their area, of their tribe. So Joseph was of Judah, of the house of David. David's city is Bethlehem. It's where he was born. It's where he served as a shepherd. That was his go-to area. When the Philistines occupied Bethlehem, it grieved the heart of the king of Israel. On one occasion saying, how I mourn and grieve that I do not get to drink the waters of Bethlehem. And his men loved him so much. They did a strategic attack on Bethlehem to oust the Philistines in order to draw water from the wells of Bethlehem and to bring it back to the king, to which David took the water and poured it out and said, I am not the God of Israel. I am only a man and the servant of my God. That was not called for. You do not shed blood for a man, right? Powerful scenes in Bethlehem. Joseph has to return to Bethlehem for the census. And then when he gets there, of course, the inns are full. And where was his extended family? Interesting, the scriptures don't tell us. It would have been odd for someone to go and stay at an inn, especially one that had extended family. So we know something else is happening. And we know that Christ's child is born. Tradition tells us in a cave. In fact, you can visit that cave in Bethlehem to this day. And then we know he's fed, he's placed in a feeding trough, a manger. Bethlehem means the city of bread. It's the city of David. He's placed in the feeding trough, right? Already indications of what he will become, the bread of life. But then what happens? Well, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, they're now a young family. They were broke, right? Joseph was a carpenter, we say. That's accurate. But more broadly, we would say he was more like what we call a general contractor, right? So Joseph probably had a little bit of money, but it was exhausted by having to go to Bethlehem and because of this new baby. On the eighth day, the Lord is circumcised. Circumcision would have happened in the local synagogue. So they would have just taken Jesus to the local synagogue there in Bethlehem to be circumcised and receive his name from his father. Forty days after birth, however, because he's the firstborn, and anyone who was the firstborn was called firstborn, even if there were no other children. He was always called the firstborn. It was a legal identifier. Because you recall during the Passover, the firstborn sons of Israel were the priests. But they worshipped the golden calf, the priest who was taken from them. And God said, I will strike the firstborn sons of Israel. And because God was in generous and kind to his people, he spared them. But he reminded Israel, as he gave the priesthood to the Levites, the firstborn your firstborn sons belong to me. So on the 40th day of the firstborn's life, he had to be taken to the temple in order to be presented to God. We've heard about this. This was Simeon and Anna who approached the Christ child. So here's this poor family who had to stay in Bethlehem. They'll probably be now at this point being assisted by extended family. They have the circumcision and then they have to go now to Jerusalem. It would have been a very difficult trip for them. But Luke tells us that they made it and the Christ child was presented. Then they returned back to Bethlehem. 
And we're not sure why they did that. Why didn't they go back to Nazareth? Now, there was a lot of speculation. One is, you'll recall, there, was a lot, there were a lot of rumors in Nazareth, right? Because this couple broke their chaste, their chaste betrothment, right? So we suspect perhaps it's the rumor mill. Perhaps they just didn't have enough money, but they knew that the extended family would support them in Bethlehem. Perhaps there was some other reason that we're not aware of. Maybe Joseph got a good contract, right? He had to go back for work. But we know they returned to Bethlehem, and that's where they stayed until the Lord was about a year and a half. At a year and a half years old, they have a house, we're told. Because the Magi today visit the house. The Magi travel for a year and a half. Oftentimes we think, oh, the Magi were there with the shepherds on the day of the Lord's birth. Not true. This is why we remove the shepherds from the nativity. Because the shepherds, they're gone. They're adoring and praising God and announcing all that had happened. But the Magi didn't arrive until a year and a half later. Imagine that tenacity, that faith, that perseverance for a year and a half. When I lose something in the rectory after a couple minutes, I'm willing to call it quits, huh? These men, these wise men travel for a year and a half. They arrive and we are told that it's a child. Now it's very beautiful is we are told that when the Magi adore him and praise him and offer their highest gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we are told they adore him while he is enthroned on the lap of his mother. Now that is highly symbolic because it represents the queen mother. She is fulfilling her role. Remember in Israel, the queen was not the king's wife. The queen was the king's mother. And already, early in his life, we see not only the Lord exercise his kingship, but Our Lady exercised her queenship. So the Magi come in a year and a half. Now we know they made a stop at Jerusalem and they told Herod about the star that they had seen. Now Herod, as the king of the Jews, should have rejoiced that finally the Messiah has come. But Herod, he wanted the power and he was not a believer. He thought someone has come up with these stories in, our, in order to oust me from authority in order to take my throne. So he's watching. Now his grandfather was Herod the Great. Herod the Great was known for his bloodthirst and his lust. His grandson was just like him. Right? So what happens when Herod finds out that the Magi found the Christ child, left, went home by another way, what does he do? He orders the execution of all boys two years and, and under throughout the Bethlehem region. Now we're not sure how many boys died. Some speculate up to around 30, some say up to about 3,000. Normally, the usual size of Jewish families, I suspect a higher number. And there's a beautiful story that's told, not in the scriptures, but in our tradition. How was John the Baptist spared? He was only three months older than our Lord. He was spared, and watch God's providence. He was spared because when they saw Elizabeth, remember she was an old lady, right? Older lady, excuse me, okay? <laughs> I almost hit that landmine, okay. <laughs> she was an older lady. Remember, she th thought she was barren. When they saw Elizabeth, they thought, oh, she doesn't have any kids, and they kept going, which is how John the Baptist was spared. So we have what we call the holy innocence, the first blood shed in defense of our Lord. Joseph, listen to the angel. Whenever we see Joseph, we see two things, the angels and obedience, right? As I've said before, Joseph was God's go-to man. If God needed something done, he could ask Joseph. He knew Joseph would do it. He tells Joseph, take your family and go to Egypt. Now you might be asking, wait a minute, how did they afford that? Huh? This is a smaller family. They're not very financially comfortable at this point. How did they afford going to Egypt? Well, the early fathers... When I speak of the early fathers, those are the second and third generation of our faith who would have known the apostles. Some of them would have been early disciples of the Lord or disciples of disciples. The early fathers tell us, simple enough, <laughs> Joseph hawked the three gifts of the Magi. <laughs> he just went to a local pawn shop, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Took the money and then took the holy family to Egypt. Now, how long were they in Egypt? You know, you can still visit the church in old Cairo, that's built over their house, St. George's Church. Beautiful little well where a lady used to go and draw water. We suspect that they were in Egypt for about six months to a year. We can gauge that because of the political leadership that's identified in the Gospels. 
and then they return home, and really home. This is when they go to Nazareth. The Christ child is about two or two and a half years old when they go to Nazareth. And then he's quiet. He learns the prayers of Israel from his father and mother. He learns his trade as a carpenter, general contractor from his father. He is quiet. It's what we call our Lord's hidden life. We see a glimpse when he's 12 years old. That's significant. Remember in Israel, then and now, 12 years old is when the boy first proclaims publicly the word of God. It's called now the bar mitzvah. That's what that is. After 12, he proclaims the word of God publicly, and he is considered a man by the law of Moses. We see a glimpse of the Lord at 12, and then we don't see him again until he's 30. What marked our, years, our Lord's 30th year? What happened? First of all, it would have been very odd in Israel that a 30-year-old man was not married. There's a long explanation of that, too. A beautiful tradition called the Essene tradition. That our Lord would not have cut his hair. He would have not drank alcohol. He would not have had sexual relations. He would have been chaste. We suspect that our Lord might have been in a scene. We know his cousin, John the Baptist, was definitely in a scene. We're not sure about our Lord, we suspect. But what happened in his 30th year to launch our Lord's public ministry? This is very endearing. We suspect by our tradition that it was the death of Joseph. It was the death of his father because he was there taking care of mom and dad. And when his father died, he began his public ministry. This is why in our tradition, St. Joseph is the patron saint of a happy death, a holy death. Because imagine that when Joseph died, he had Jesus on one side and Mary on the other, a patron of a holy death. Now we know that Joseph would have had to die before our Lord began his public ministry. Why is that? Because Joseph's vocation was to guard and protect the Christ child. He would never have been able to begin his ministry. And the Lord would never have been able to endure the passion if Joseph would have been alive. Because Joseph would have defended Christ, would have died in his defense. So it was the death of his father, his earthly father, that initiated his public ministry. Dear friends, I've just given you a small portion of the chronology of the beautiful story of the plan in which God has saved us, the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus. I hope that by just this glimpse, it has perhaps whet your appetite to know more. And I encourage you with that to dive into the scriptures. Read Matthew and Luke. Only two of the four gospel writers tell us about our Lord's early life. Try to understand what has happened. Why is this being recounted to us? Why is it significant? That's the first part I want to give you. The second part, I just want to talk about why it's so important that the Magi came when our Lord was one and a half years old. You see, God at the beginning of time wanted to give his blessings to all his children. But we rebelled, constantly rebelled, constantly rebelled to the point where God said, you know what? I'm just going to pick my firstborn and I'll work with them. So God went to the firstborn son of Noah, Shem, and to his descendants, the Semites, these are the Jewish people. You hear about someone being anti-Semitic. That's where it comes from, Shem of Noah. He went to the sons and daughters of Shem, the firstborn of Noah, and said, I will give to Israel, to the Semites, all the blessings that one day I will return to all the nations, to the Gentiles. And that's in salvation history. And the prophets especially emphasize this, that when the Messiah comes, he will reunite the tribes. When the Messiah comes, he will open up the gates of paradise, the path to salvation to the Gentiles. This is what the Messiah is going to do. And they waited and they prophesied and they give clues. We hear about Bethlehem today being mentioned by Micah, the prophet Micah. And the slow preparation and slow movement towards that. But the average Jew, the average rabbi in the time of our Lord, they've forgotten that prophecy. This is why today in our second reading, Paul has to remind them the Gentiles were to be a part of the plan of salvation because many people later in the Lord's life struggled as the Lord began to welcome the Gentiles. At one point, they tried to stone him to death. It was not his time to die. And we are told in the scriptures, he passed through them. But the Gentile, the welcoming of the Gentiles, that's us. That's our path to salvation. It was very controversial. But here at the beginning, we see the fulfillment of the Lord's ministry. First, he will reunite Israel. And then secondly, he will welcome and invite the Gentiles back to salvation. 
This is why it's so significant, the epiphany. It's Greek, it means the manifestation of God to the nations. That today, even as a boy, a young child, the Messiah is beginning to fulfill his vocation as the Gentile nations come to him, pay him homage. It's significant that God used the star. Perhaps you might wonder, well, wait a minute. If they follow the star, doesn't that justify astrology? No, <laughs> no. Astrology is vehemently denied throughout the scriptures. Why? Because, dear friends, we have a loving father. We don't have to read the stars or worry about the entrails of animals or play in the mud or wear crystals. We don't have to do such things. We are the children of God and well-beloved by him. Today, God used the star because that's what he needed in order to speak to them. The Magi understood stars, so God humbled himself and communicated with them in a way that they would understand. But look what he did. He did a coup d'etat on the astrology of old, didn't he? Because he used their very means, what they understood, in order to reveal his son. Dear friends, do you understand that in our lives, no matter how far we think we are, or if we are hard-hearted, or far from away, or from God, or from his grace, do we realize that no matter where we are, God continues to send small stars to each of us, seeds of his revelation, that we might know how much he loves us, desires fellowship with us, how much he has been seeking us out long before we ever thought about looking for him. Today on this high feast of the Epiphany, look at the God who loves you, who sends you stars, so that you might not ever lose him, that you might always know how to find him, and that by finding him, your salvation, the salvation of the Gentiles, might continue.